The following is a production of New Mexico State University. You, you heard his discussion at the beginning of this, the way he views world events and national events, and I will tell you that I miss those conversations. Uh, from 1988 to 2006, when I worked for him, we used to have those conversations almost every day. He is a man who has, a, has remarkable insight into the challenges faced by this country and faced by the world. So before I, I also want to say he, he, he said that I was one of the top five experts on nuclear issues. Very much not true. But what, what I did have the advantage of doing is during those years when I worked for Senator Domenici, as you see at this conference, he had access to the world's most renowned experts on any topic. And I had the opportunity to participate in those conversations, and some little part of it rubbed off on me. So what you're going to hear today in my talk is the sorts of conversations that Senator Domenici and I used to have almost every day. The sorts of conversations that would stretch my mind, that informed his policy making, and that were manifest in some of the things we did on nuclear issues, on dismantling Russian weapons, on uh, securing fissile materials in Russia, on doing the Energy Policy Act of 2005, on opening the waste isolation pilot plant, and those sorts of things. In some ways, what I hope, and one of the greatest compliments I could receive at the end of this talk, is that it provides some insight into the way that Senator Domenici thinks. So if you'll go to the first slide for me, please. This is a standard energy talk slide, and I'm going to change the format entirely in just a minute, but I want to give you a primer about most of the energy conversations that go on in Washington, right? So 48.5% of the U.S. electricity comes from coal, 21% from natural gas, 19 or 20% comes from nuclear, 6% comes from hydropower, and 3.5% come from renewables, renew solar, wind, geothermal, that sort of thing. This is the standard slide that gets used in conversations in Washington. And when I worked for Senator Domenici on the staff of the Senate Energy Committee, senators and lobbyists and interest groups would come in all the time and they would talk about their piece of the pie. I would estimate that 70% of the energy conversation in Washington, am I doing something wrong? 70% of the energy conversation in Washington is about that 3.5% renewables and others piece of the pie. That's where policymakers are focused. They think that by expanding solar and renewable energy, by increasing efficiency, that we can solve the energy challenges facing this country. Before we move on, I want you to recognize that this is not all energy in the United States. This is about half the energy in the United States is on this slide because this is just electricity. So there's no transportation energy in here where solar and renewables don't do anything. This is just electricity. And not only that, this is just U.S. electricity. And what we face today is not just a U.S. electricity problem or a U.S. energy problem. We face a global energy problem. And I want to get to that. And I want to do it first by stretching your mind a little bit with the next slide. You are here. <laughs> I didn't go all the way out, remember? There are billions of galaxies. I decided to focus on one galaxy. That's our solar system down there in the corner, and Earth is circling around that star. But I wanted you to step back, and I want to then talk about how we should approach the energy discussions here on planet Earth. And there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. You can talk about where the resources are, who's got coal, who's got oil, who's got natural gas. You can talk about where the energy demand is in the industrialized part of the world. You can talk about carbon. I want to approach it through one path. There's different ways of doing it, but I want to start by talking about people. Next slide. In 1950, there were 2.5 billion people on this planet. Today, there are a little over 6 billion people, and by 2050, there will be over 9 billion people on the planet. Now, I use 2050 because a lot of the discussions about climate change have goals for carbon, reduction, carbon emission reductions in 2030, the furthest one out is 2050. So I want to talk about the world that we expect we're going to live in in 2050. It used to drive Senator Domenici and I crazy that people would come in when he was chairman of the Energy Committee and talk about the 3.5 percent of U.S. electricity generation that was solar and renewable when we were thinking about how in the world are we going to meet global energy demands in the year 2050. Because particularly when you talk about climate change and you talk about CO2 emissions, it does not matter where in the world the CO2 comes from if it affects climate change. Next slide, please. So I just want to give you some idea, for those of you who don't think about 9 billion all the time, right? You travel the world these days, you can pretty much get by on the English language. 
billion of the 6.1 billion people on the planet today speak some amount of English. They're not fluent. They speak some amount of English. So when you go around the world, those are the people you're interacting with. More people than speak English have no access to electricity. Not only do they not have power 24 hours a day, they don't have an electrical generator. They don't have a battery because they don't have electric gadgets or appliances in their house. More shocking than that, of the 6.1 billion people on Earth today, 2.2 billion use firewood or dung. They burn manure as their primary source of energy to heat their house, to cook their food. That is the energy challenge we face today. Forget 2050, okay? Those 2.2 billion people aspire to have the sort of energy we have in the United States. I know there are people who say we should use less energy. I think we can use less energy. We can save some amount of the energy that we use through efficiency, through conservation, et cetera. Meanwhile, there are 2.2 billion people who will do anything they can get act to get access to energy. They have justification. Next slide. Energy is a principal determinant of quality of life. This is human mortality rates charted against access to electricity. The more electricity you have, the longer you live. There's a moral justification for access to electricity. It's not the only one. Next slide. This is access to electricity charted against per capita economic output. The more energy you have, the more you as an individual in this world can produce. The better your quality of life, the better your standard of living, the better the standard of living for your children. Okay. Next slide. So I live in Washington, D.C. This is global population distribution. It's not a very detailed map. The darker red it gets, the denser the population. You'll notice that in the United States, there is a sliver of dark red. It's that Richmond, Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Boston corridor, where if you get on the train, there is not an open field the whole way. That's the most crowded spot in the United States. And look at it, it is a tiny sliver in the U.S. All of coastal China is dark red all of India, Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa. The concentration, the density of people living in these areas is extraordinary. For those of you living in Las Cruces, it's like nothing you can imagine. Okay? Now, when those people start looking to, to, to get access to more energy, the International Energy Agency does forecasts of what global energy demand is going to be. Next slide. They forecast that by 2050, the world is going to demand 30% more energy. But the part that's going to make this conversation really challenging is that in the non-OECD countries, the countries that do not currently belong to the Organization of Economic Develop of it's a French term, the OECD, the developed countries, those countries, those developing nations, are going to increase their demand for energy three times what it is today. Sri Lanka, India, the Philippines, China. Okay. So we, we're going to struggle with our elect energy demand requirements. Duke is trying to figure out how to build more baseline. That's nothing compared to the type of energy capacity that has to be brought online in the developing world. That's what's going to drive global energy policy okay, as we go forward. The, what's the reality of that? I, I'm in Washington every day. We have lots of conversations about this coal plant or this natural gas plant or this nuclear plant, et cetera. These are trees right up in front of our faces. I've got next. The next slide is a quote. Hold on just a second. From, uh, go, uh, go ahead. This is a, a quote from Fareed Zakaria's book, The Post-American World. Now, Fareed Zakaria... Uh, is the editor of Newsweek International. He's also got a show on CNN, something GPS, where he interviews world leaders. Okay, he doesn't do energy and climate stuff. He does global population. He does energy. He does macroeconomic stuff. This is his assessment. Demand for electricity is projected to rise over 4% a year for decades, and that electricity will mostly come from the dirtiest fuel available, coal. Coal is cheap and plentiful, so the world relies on it to, pr to produce most of its electricity. Next chart. To understand the impact on global warming, consider this fact. Between 2006 and 2012, China and India will build 800 new, new, new coal-fired power plants with combined CO2 emissions five times the total savings of the Kyoto Accords. That's the scale of the problem that we're facing. 
Okay, and that's just China and India. That's just a portion of global population growth out over the next several decades, okay? So when we talk about climate policy in Washington, and we talk about renewables going from 3.5% of generation to 10% of generation in the U.S. and deploying wind and solar, fantastic. 800 new coal plants in China by 2012. Five times the reductions we're contemplating in the Kyoto Accords. The question is scale. This is a challenge, the scale of which we have not faced before. And I hope that as, we, as I go through this and I present challenges of scale, you'll keep in mind the scale of the challenges and also, frankly, how hard it is for policymakers dealing with incrementalism in Washington to understand the impact of scale. Next slide, please. This is, uh, this is kind of just, you know, keep this in mind, okay? This is CO2 emissions growth through 2004. I decided to stick with demonstrated CO2 emissions, not do some of the forecasts because there's lots of debate. But you see the slope on this line. The forecasts just keep getting steeper and steeper as we go forward. Okay. So I've talked about population going from 6.1 billion to over 9 billion, but that's only part of the population problem. There's another aspect to global population forecasts that compounds the problem. Okay. It's population distribution. Okay. Next slide. So today, half the world's population live in rural areas and half live in urban areas. The rural areas, particularly in the developing world, developing world are closely connected to agrarian economies, but more and more people are moving to the cities. They're moving to the cities for reasons that you and I understand. It's quality of life. It's, it's new jobs. It's education. It's the excitement of the cities. Okay. By 2050, 70% of the global population is going to have moved to the cities. Okay, so we've got to figure out how we're going to get a lot more energy. But we've also got to consider where the energy is going to be going. It's going to be going to mega cities. Okay, the amount of nuclear energy generated in the United States in 2008 can be replaced by, sol by a solar farm. Okay, the solar farm would have to cover the state of New Jersey. As in, we couldn't get from Maryland to New York because you couldn't fit the New Jersey Turnpike in anymore. Okay? Those are the sorts of issues we have to deal with. How are we going to get massive amounts of energy to 70% of the world's population living in cities, in manufacturing jobs, in apartment buildings? A couple of numbers, some details on that. Next slide, please. So in 2050, global population increases by 3 billion people from where it is today. The urban population doubles from where it is today to 6.4 billion people. Okay. Most of that growth occurs in the Asian underdeveloped economies. 1.8 billion additional people. Remember where Fareed Zakaria said they were going to build 800 new coal plants just by 2012? There's going to be another 1.8 billion people in those economies, all of whom are going to want access to energy. The growth in population occurs where energy consumption is going to triple between 2007 and 2050. So let's do a little bit of scale issues in some charts. Let's have some fun with this, um, if it's fun. This is fun to me. Domenici and I used to have these conversations all the time. He'd sit there and say, like, okay, what are we going to do? Next slide, mega cities. So in 1950, we had two cities in the world with in excess of 10 million people. New York City, we all know it's big, 12.3 million people. Tokyo had 11.3 million people. I think for a lot of policymakers, they, when they think of big cities, they think of New York City and Tokyo. Maybe they're up to speed up to 1975. Next slide. Okay. 1975. Next slide, please. We, Mexico City comes along at 10.7 billion people. Okay. The first time you see one of these mega cities in the developing world. 
Go to 2000. Next slide. This is 2007. I couldn't find 2000 data. Um, that's 19 cities of over 10 billion people, with Tokyo at 36 million people. Okay? Look at the left hand column. Every city below New York is in the developing world. Mexico City, Mumbai, Sao Paulo, Delhi, Shanghai, Calcutta, Dhaka. Okay? That's where the population explosion is occurring. Now that's 2007. Let's go to 2025. Next slide, please. Okay? 27 cities. Okay? New York City, which in 2007, uh, in uh, to New York City today is 19 million people. So in 2050, it wouldn't even make it onto my far left-hand column. Okay? Every city on the far left-hand column is bigger than New York City today. You'll notice that New York doesn't grow very much, interestingly, between now and 2050. It goes from 19.0 million today to 20.6 million in 2050 because we're seeing slower growth rate in the big cities, in the mega cities, in the industrialized world, in the developed world. But Mumbai's 26 billion people by then. Delhi's 22 billion, 22 million people. The cause 22 million people. These are stunningly large mega cities. Cities are a challenge, but there are some good things about cities. Okay, next slide. New York City has some of the lowest per capita energy consumption in the United States. Why? Mass transit, okay? Subways, metros, great for per capita energy consumption rates to go down. Also, high-rise apartment buildings, if they're modern ones, are pretty good, right? I mean, you think about a high-rise, one side faces to the outside, the, the, the top and the bottom and both other walls have units next to them, provides great insulation. Once you get one of those buildings to a comfortable temperature to live in, it's pretty easy to keep it at that temperature. So there are some, it's a lot better than a mobile home, okay, as far as energy efficiency. So there are some advantages to these dense megacities. But how in the world are you going to get enough power to run those cities? I'm a fan of all low carbon energy technologies. Okay? But if you'll go to the next slide, I want to talk about some of them just a little bit. Wind and solar deserve a great deal of consideration, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm simply going to point out that they are not dense and they are intermittent. If you, run, if you run an electrical appliance off of wind, you're going to have electricity about 30% of the time. Solar is less than that. Okay? You can put them in in part of the mix on the grid, but somewhere you've got to have base load power that's pumping out power 24 hours a day. So you can go down and open your fridge at 2 o'clock in the morning and see what's in there when the light comes on. Okay? I want to talk about, since I've talked about scale and density of, of the urban populations and the, and the global population, I want to talk about the density of energy. Okay? Different things have ener different energy content. Okay? Now, firewood, coal, and oil have one thing in com common. It's carbon. Okay? They are sources of carbon that when you combust them, when you combine them with oxygen, release heat. Okay? It's a chemical reaction. You combine the carbon in it with oxygen, it, it burns, it combusts, it releases heat. We use it to turn turbines or fire power plants or run boilers, whatever it happens to be. But there's a difference in the energy density, and density is very important here. So if you have a kilogram of firewood, you can get about one kilowatt, one, one kWh of electricity. One, we'll just leave it at kWh. Coal is denser, three kWh's of electricity per kilogram of coal. That's why coal is a good energy source if you want to run a power plant. You've also got a lot of it. Oil is even denser four kilowatt hours of electricity out of a kilogram of coal. That's why we like to use liquids in transportation. That's why I was able to fly here from Washington on a plane. Try to, try to power it by firewood, it doesn't work, okay? You need extremely dense energy sources, and liquids and gases are very dense sources of carbon. That's why we use them in the transportation sector. I want to volunteer. I need an av I need. How about you with a microphone since you're closest? Come on, we're going to talk about energy density with you. You're a carbon being, you're a carbon life form, right? Yes. You've got some amount of carbon. How much energy do you think is contained in this person? You're not, you're not married, right? No. Yeah, see, my wife would say I've basically got no energy. 
okay? But let's talk about it, you know, let's compare him to gasoline, okay? If we stopped feeding him now, okay, so he didn't get additional energy in, do you think he could push a car 30 miles? Like a gallon of gasoline? Somewhere in that range. Looks like he could probably push a car 30 miles. Might take him a while, right? But you get an idea of how much energy is in, is in a person. And I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. So just stand here for just a second. Now, I want to talk about scale. Show me the next slide, please. Does anybody recognize this number? Did you just see a hand go up? What's the number? Speed of light. Thank you. Bless you. 299,792,458 is the speed of light in meters per second. It's a big number. When I talk about 9 billion people on Earth and I'm talking about big numbers, I'm trying to find a solution that comes from big numbers. And so for just a couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about the speed of light. Okay? If you square the speed of light, okay, go forward. Next slide. Here's the answer in case nobody knew what was the speed of light. Next slide. If you square the speed of light, it's 90 quadrillion meters squared per second squared. Now we're talking big numbers. Okay, so now what I want you to do is I just want you to remember 90 quadrillion. Next slide. I'm going to try to do something I've never done with an audience before, so bear with me for just a second. I, in three slides, am going to try to explain to you Einstein's special theory of relativity and how we are going to power a planet with 9 billion people living on it. Three slides, so bear with me. To do it, I'm going to quote two paragraphs from a book by Bill Bryson. The book is entitled Short History of Nearly Everything. So hold on to your seats. Next slide, please. E equals mc squared. In simplest terms, what the equation says is that mass and energy have an equivalence. They are two forms of the same thing. Energy is liberated matter. Matter is energy waiting to happen. E is energy. M is mass. Energy equals mass times c squared. We'll get to that. Since c squared, the speed of light times itself, which is 90 quadrillion, remember. So the equation above is energy equals mass times 90 quadrillion is a truly enormous number. What the equation is saying is that there is a huge amount, a really huge amount of energy bound up in every material thing. Okay, now it sounds crazy, okay? That's what they said when Albert Einstein published it for the first time because he was a patent clerk in an office in Bern, Switzerland. They said he was crazy. Next slide. This is continuing from Bill Bryson. You may not feel outstandingly robust, but if you are an average size adult, I got one here, you will contain within your modest frame no less than 7 times 10 to the 18 joules of potential energy, enough to explode with the force of 30 very large hydrogen bombs. That'll push a car 30 miles. Assuming you knew how to liberate it and really wished to make a point. So how is it that we went from he might be able to push a car 30 miles to 30 hydrogen bombs? The difference is the difference between chemical energy and atomic energy. When we talk about chemical energy, we take about take the, taking the carbon in his body, combining it with oxygen in a chemical reaction to produce heat. When we talk about atomic energy, we talk about taking the atoms in his body, breaking them apart, and releasing that energy. That energy that, bound, that binds protons, neutrons, and electrons is massive. Massive. Next slide. Still reading from Bill Bryson. Everything has this kind of energy trapped within it. We're just not very good at getting it out. Even a uranium bomb, the most energetic thing we have produced yet, releases less than 1% of the energy it could release if only we were more cunning. Okay? So the next time you get asked how much energy you have in you, the answer is, according to Albert Einstein, he has the energy of 30 hydrogen bombs in him. I'm done with you. Thank you. Thank you.
So I earlier showed a slide of energy density, if you go to the next slide. And on that slide, I showed firewood and coal and oil, and I said they had 1 kWh of electricity, of electricity equivalent, 3, 4. Uranium, broken up in an atomic reaction, has 400,000 kWh's of electricity in it for the same kilogram of mass. Now that is energy on a big scale. That is how you power a planet of 9 billion people, 70% of whom live in dense megacities. All right. So now I'm going to step back to not talking about Albert Einstein, the stuff I'm a little more comfortable about. Next slide. By 2050, we've got to figure out how to give 5 billion people access to electricity. That's more people than get electricity today on planet Earth. And we have to do it by, while reducing CO2 emissions from today's level down to 20% of today's level. 5 billion more people, 20% of the CO2 emissions. Okay. Recall Fareed Zakaria's quote, coal is cheap and plentiful between 2006 and 2012. China and India will build 800 coal plants. Let me talk for a minute about how I think we're going to respond to that challenge. Next slide. First is, we have to figure out how to deal with CO2 emissions. We have to figure out how to prevent it from going into the atmosphere. We have to sequester it. We have to chemically bind it with something. We have to do something because those countries are coal rich. They have exploding populations. They have demand for energy. They are going to use their coal. We have to figure out a way to use it that it does not emit CO2. Okay? It also has to be done affordably. If you go to India and China and other developing nations as they're trying to provide electricity for their 1.8 billion new people, and you tell them you found the solution, but it requires either injection into geologic formations they don't have, or to do it takes 80% of the electricity the coal plant is going to produce to compress it, chill it, pipe it, and pump it underground. Or if you tell them it's going to be very expensive, what's the reaction going to be? They're not going to do it. They've got people who want cheap electricity. Why? Because you live longer if you have it. Because you have a higher standard of living. Because your kids have a better quality of life. You're not going to implement some policy worldwide that's going to, keep, that's going to turn that fundamental human interest around. So we've got to come up with affordable ways of sequestering CO2 that can be done worldwide. We must deploy every energy efficiency, every renewable, every low carbon technology you can possibly imagine, and ones that have not yet been invented, on a massive scale. Now, I will tell you this, and I don't put it on the slides because it's, it's, it's controversial, but I don't think we can do it. I don't think we can possibly avoid emitting those, the sorts of volumes of CO2 that will result in significant climate change. So on top of this, and the subject of a completely different talk is, what do you do when the climate starts to change? Who does it? Who pays for it? These sorts of issues. Those megacities are in coastal areas. Okay, you want to add complexity to the challenge? Flood a couple of them. So what are low carbon technologies? My next slide is life cycle CO2 emissions. When you build a nuclear plant, you use a lot of concrete, you use a lot of steel. When you produce concrete and steel, you release CO2. And people come around, they argue nuclear is not CO2 free. You've got it in the concrete, you've got it in steel. Yes, you do. You use CO2. You also, every 18 months when the truck pulls up to refuel the plant, you use diesel to drive the truck, and I sit and I sit with Greenpeace, and I go through and I admit that, yes, the employees drive cars to the plants and all this sort of stuff. But when you compare life cycle emissions of technologies, this is it. Coal is at the left-hand column. Natural gas is next. You can save a lot of CO2 emissions by going from coal to natural gas. That's about a 40% reduction in CO2 emissions just by switching from coal to natural gas. What I'm saying is that all those things on the right-hand side of this chart have got to be deployed on a massive scale. I said that one of the challenges was we had to find cheap ways of doing this or, they, or the technologies just wouldn't be embraced around the world. So if you'll go to the next slide, 
This is a U.S. slide. This is my, this is my one U.S. slide, I think. Uh, this is electricity production costs, uh, 1995, I think it's 95 through 2008. Nuclear is the green line. It's the cheapest source of baseload electricity, okay? Less than two cents a kilowatt hour. You can build nuclear plants, operate them safely as we do in the United States, and produce electricity very cheaply. Now, a lot of people will point out to you that natural gas prices, Peyton, have plummeted in the last year. And you may see that natural gas line, that blue line, fall dramatically. Two cents, three cents, four cents a kilowatt hour. And that is true. Natural gas is in many ways a very attractive fuel source. But for the last eight years, nuclear has been the cheapest baseload source of electricity in the United States. I'm gonna conclude, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna flip forward to one slide. One of the student questioners, Amanda, asked about used fuel storage. I've given sort of a different than usual nuclear talk here today because, frankly, Senator Dimension and I had all the very usual nuclear discussions over the last several years. I wanted to do something different and have fun. This is the sort of speech I wanted to write for him for a long time, but he, he'd never get past the first page. He always would take my speeches and he'd read it, and I'd worked so hard on them, and he'd, he'd just take them and then he'd say, and I'll submit the rest of the record. And I'm just sitting there in the back of the room, getting no satisfaction out of it. But Amanda, you asked about used fuel storage, and that is something that gets asked a lot. So if you're operating slides, I have a series of slides in the back that are to help me answer any questions. So if you'll start going through them, give me one second on each one. I'm going to tell you when to stop to help answer Amanda's slide. Keep going. Go. 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 Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Stop. Used fuel storage. Okay, this is how we store used fuel in nuclear power plants. Now, I believe that used fuel should be shipped and disposed of at Yucca Mountain. Uh, when I start, first started working for Senator Domenici, we did the legislation to open the waste isolation pilot plant. That's a 15 million year old salt formation underground. I believe you can put material from the weapons complex underground at WIP and you can store it safely indefinitely on human scale of time. But the Yucca Mountain program in Nevada has been blocked by politics, of which I'm very respectful. I try to operate in accordance with political reality, not political ideals. And so for the time being, we store spent nuclear fuel from utilities, from reactors, in pools of water, upper left-hand column. And I'm looking at this room. I was at the Indian Point reactor several months ago, and the used fuel pool there, and Indian Point's been in operation since about 1965. The used fuel pool at Indian Point is about the size of one of these light squares. It's deeper than this, it's deeper than this space because the fuel rods are long, but all the used fuel from that plant since its inception in 1965 is stored in a room about the size of one of these squares. We had assumed that used fuel was gonna start moving to Yucca Mountain in 1998, and it hasn't. And so utilities increasingly are taking that used fuel out of the pools, they're putting them in dry casks, and they're storing them in casks like this. There's no liquid around them, they're air-cooled, they sit there in those casks. Those casks are licensed for decades. I think they can be stored for decades. That's the extent of the used fuel problem in the United States. It's a political problem, okay? You get mayors and local officials who get upset, not so much because they consider it, dip, because they consider it dangerous, but because they consider its storage there to be a, a, a violation of the contract, the, the implied contract between the utility and the community. It's if we're gonna build this plant, we're gonna have this many people operating, we're gonna produce this much electricity, we're gonna pay this much taxes, and used fuel is gonna get shipped off to Yucca Mountain beginning in these years. And we're not able to honor that, that commitment that we made to the, to the city fathers and the leaders around our plants. And it's, it's extraordinarily frustrating. But it's not a threat to human health, safety, or the environment stored in casks, just like that. So that was hopefully an answer to Amanda's question, and with that, I'm willing to take anybody else's questions. While he's getting that question, I have a question. If my mass is greater now than when I was 20 years old, do I have more energy? <laughs> and if so, why don't I feel that way? You, Peyton, are a global resource. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. Um, Leo Delgado, I'm here from NMSU. My question for you is, 
Um, I like how you spoke about the large scale that that energy needs to be produced for. Um, and my question for you was, uh, and we heard in the previous presentation, many components have to be imported from uh, from foreign countries. And we hear a lot of talk about becoming energy independent. Uh, and my question for you was, how is moving towards nuclear power making us energy independent when the United States doesn't produce enough uranium to, per, to power these uh, nuclear power plants on the scale that you talk about? Yeah. Uh, let's see. There's two issues, and I'm going to hopefully answer both of them. First is supply for manufactured components for nuclear power plants. In the 60s and 70s, most of the components manufactured for U.S. nuclear power plants were were produced in the United States. In the 80s and 90s, we lost that capacity. So today, we do not have forging capabilities to forge the ultra-heavy pressure vessels and reactor heads that we now procure at Japan Steelworks. There's a queue at Japan Steelworks. Uh, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, I read an article yesterday that uh, the Chinese had just placed an order for 100 reactor heads at Japan Steelworks. And there's a, there's a problem in ensuring that we have access to that production capacity. I mean, one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, we, so we have 104 power plants, civilian power plants operating in the U.S. today. Okay. Interestingly, we have 103 Navy reactors operating in the U.S. today, which is probably the greatest source of both the people who operate our power plants and also the technology that we use. Worldwide, there are 435 new nuclear, there are 435 nuclear plants operating. There are 35 power plants under construction today. Okay, concrete being poured, steel being bent. One of them, a TVA retrofit, is underway here in the U.S. We have a problem in competing in this global market for production capacity. It is significantly easier if you can procure components here in the United States. One reason alone. Okay, uh, All of our components have to be manufactured to NRC or ASME standards. It is much easier to certify their production at a U.S. plant and then ship that component to a construction site in the U.S. than it is to have that component manufactured in Indonesia or Japan or China or wherever it else happens to be and shipped to the U.S. We would like to see as much manufacturing capacity as possible restored to the U.S. It's, it's frankly, I do politics. The need for additional manufacturing capacity is one of the principal new political drivers for building new nuclear plants. So uh, Duke and other companies are looking to build nuclear plants largely driven by where Electricity demand is forecast to rise the greatest, which is largely in the southeast where we've got new industry moving in. And so there's this crescent from Maryland into Texas where most of the new plants are, are, are proposed. But what we're seeing is a new base of support for building nuclear from the upper Midwest, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, where they're trying to reestablish some of that forging capacity and other infrastructure capacity. It's going to take years, and we have a challenge that we have an uncertainty. If I went to to Bethlehem Steel and said, absolutely, here's a firm fixed order for 10 new reactors, we could get new forging capacity stood up in the U.S. But until we have that sort of, sort of certainty, we're probably going to be ordering from overseas. It's a problem. But when, when I think about this next several decades, I believe that the expansion of civilian nuclear worldwide is inevitable. It simply is a question of where is that additional manufacturing capacity going to be added? Is it going to be an expansion of Japan Steelworks? or the Spanish facility, or the Italian facility, or is it going to be a refurbish refurbishment and recreation of capacity here in the United States? I'm sorry for that long answer. Yeah. Fuel. Thank you, Governor. appreciate that. Um, the United States has massive supplies of uranium, okay? We currently, and, and you can approach this issue in many different ways, Right now, we, every 18 months, we put fuel rods in a reactor. The reactor runs at 100% of capacity for 18 months. We then shut it down for refueling about 27 days, remove the fuel rods, put in new fuel rods. That 27 days, by the way, is the reason that our reactors have about a 91.5% capacity factor. It's not, it's, not, it's not that we're down 8% of the time for some reason. It's that you've got to refuel it about once every 18 months. Okay. When we remove that used fuel, okay, we've used up 4% of the capacity of that fuel. Okay, current plan in the United States is to send it to Yucca Mountain to be disposed of. Okay. What the French do is they recycle that fuel. They extract the plutonium that's been generated, they extract the uranium available for future use. So we can address our, our uranium requirements in a number of different ways. First of all, we have a lot of resources that we have not been mining in the United States in recent years in large, 
in large part because one of the things Senator Domenici did that I think is one of his greatest legacies is he implemented an agreement with the Russian Federation by which the highly enriched uranium from 500 tons of HEU that literally under the safeguards requirements was at one time Russian nuclear weapons aimed at the United States is blended down into low enriched uranium. It's, it's enriched about 90% to go in a warhead. It's enriched, it's down blended to about 4%, turned into low enriched uranium, shipped to the United States, gets burned up in our reactors here in the United States. So, you know, 10% of electricity in the U.S., or 20% of electricity in the U.S. comes from nuclear power. 10% of it, half the nuclear power, comes from Russian warheads. We have massive supplies of highly enriched uranium in Russia, but also in the United States. Pantex facility outside Amarillo, where we store our excess highly enriched uranium. We have the ability to extract uranium from, sea, from the sea. We have a lot of uranium mines here in, in New Mexico, Utah, Arizona. Canada is a huge resource of uranium. If we, re, if we recycled all of the demonstrated uranium reserves today in the world, we'd have 7,000 years worth of uranium to produce the amount of nuclear electricity the use, world uses today. Not to scale it up, but just to stay steady state. Fifty years. You know, the, the Rickover program, which was the Naval Reactors program, which developed all of our submarine uh, our, our nuclear submarine propulsion system now powers our nuclear uh, powered aircraft carriers uh, is one of the great strengths of this country. Uh, it was the elite of the elite in the Navy. Admiral Rickover was an extraordinarily demanding boss. At his retirement ceremony from the Navy, every living U.S. president came to his retirement ceremony. It's an extraordinary example of the difference one man can make in this country. And, and the results are, are remarkable. When the USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier went to sea, it had five reactors on it. They will refuel more frequently than this, but if they needed to, they could go 50 years between refuelings. Okay. That's energy density, by the way. The reactor technology for the Navy are generally smaller reactors. Utilities have moved towards larger reactors because they're trying to get scale off of their capital costs. And so they're looking at building 1,200 to 1,500 megawatt reactors. But, but it is interesting. That does create problems. Five to six billion dollars in capital for one of those, long construction time frame. And then also, when you put that much electricity on the grid at one time, it's a huge jump. And the truth is, grow, the demand on the grid grows incrementally over time. And so there are now companies, B&W in particular, which is a principal naval reactors contractor, that have said, we want to bring online smaller reactors that can follow load growth, that have much lower capital costs, that are much closer, much more closely related to the reactors developed by the Naval Reactors Program. And I think it's a very interesting possibility. The market in the U.S. is going to make that determination, but there are utility companies that are looking at smaller modular reactors by B&W and other companies. Are you giving me the hook? Uh, uh, yes. Al Alex, uh, uh, we have one more student with a question, and then shall we finish with the senator? Okay, Pete? Hi, Casey O'Neill, undergrad here at New Mexico State. Um, you spoke about the extended supply of uranium and how it can be re recycled to, um, to extend supply. Um, but how do we initially safely mine uranium? And I know that's an issue that's not generally talked about. It's, it's normally a storage of uranium, but how is, it, how is it mined safely in the first place? Yeah, uranium mining is a particularly sensitive issue in New Mexico, um, particularly because during the Cold War, the U.S. government signed contracts for or mined directly uranium, and they did it at sort of a, uh, with, with the only consideration being national security. Uh, and there were, there were a lot of criticisms about the health effects associated with uranium mining operations all the way up through the 60s. Um, I'm not an expert on the field. My understanding, and if someone in the room is, is better at this than me, I, you can correct the record. Those were open underground mines. 
Miners were underground for long periods of time. They were exposed to not just uranium, but other radioactive materials down there. And they did have incidences of increased cancer and other health issues. Uh, it's, a, it's a tragic consequence of the Cold War mentality about the production of uranium. Um, we don't mine uranium for the most part that way anymore. I mean, first of all, we are much more cognizant of the health issues associated with it. And so where we do have open mines, we take protective measures to minimize exposure. And we can keep the worker exposure down to very low levels. Secondly, for the most part here in the United States, we don't even go underground anymore to mine. We, we, we pump water down, dissolves the uranium, we pump the water back up out of the ground. This is in situ leach technology. We then extract the uranium from the water. There are people who worry that the in injection of water underground could spread into drinking water aquifers. We work with the EPA and states to ensure that that doesn't happen. And it's a rigorous regulatory process. There are public hearings, and frequently, there's debate about those issues at the public hearings, as there should be. To the best of my knowledge, there has not been a problem with contamination of taking uranium that is already underground, it's in the dirt, and forcing it into drinking water supplies. Uh, we, it, it's, you know, Ellen's response to the issue of risk was, was, a, was the way this industry approaches risk. We do not claim to be risk-free. We are extremely cognizant of the risk associated with every aspect of the operations of a nuclear power plant. Um, I, called a, I called a nuclear utility executive one time on the phone when I worked for Senator Domenici and I talked to him for about 40 minutes one evening about 6 o'clock. And uh, months later I met he and his wife somewhere and, he said, and she said, oh, you're Alex. You kept us pulled over on I-95 for 40 minutes one night. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, within our nuclear operations you're not allowed to talk on a cell phone while you're driving a car. And so they pulled off on the side of the road and talked to me for 40 minutes on the way up. It's an extreme example, but we take that sort of approach to safety in the nuclear facilities. We will recognize there's risk. We do everything we possibly can to mitigate risk. So I'm going to close with one story. I was at the Salem Pope Creek facility in New Jersey a couple of weeks ago, meeting with the senior management. And uh, they did a report of all the safety issues in the last month. About a half hour meeting on safety, 15 minutes of which was on the single OSHA reported incident during the past month. They'd had a subcontractor come in and he'd been using a forklift and you know he's got the tines that come out the front and as he'd been adjusting the tines to fit the pallet, it had come too close together and pinched his fingers. It was an OSHA recordable incident. The senior manager of the plant, the site vice president, the chief of officer, spent 15 minutes trying to understand what best practices in industry were for mitigating those sorts of accidents. That's the approach we take to all operations in a nuclear power plant. It's why we've never had a death in the civilian nuclear power industry in the United States. Okay. It's an industry that, because of, frankly, the, the example that Admiral Rickover established, works to the highest possible standards for health, safety, and the environment. All right. Senator. Uh, Alex. Uh <clears throat> I think it would be good if you would comment on, on uh, you know, the, the lingering issue that was brought up by uh, our distinguished guest from the South, and it seems to be going through yours, is that it takes too long to license, and then obviously it takes very long to build. Uh, it is fair to say, is it not, that uh, when we did the reform so as to bring more certainty to nuclear power plants in the uh, 05 Act, um, that uh, more work was done on incentives and other things than on narrowing or, <clears throat> or skinning down the time it would take to build a nuclear power plant. That's right. true, is it? Yes, sir. And we have not, there's nobody with a bill or a hearing yet that has looked at in detail how we might make that time smaller. Right. Is that correct? Uh, there are some bills that have been but introduced, not, not but nothing's much. being seriously considered. It, it, isn't it your opinion that or is it that uh, looking at the long delay now versus the attitude of the public and the fact that most power plants are going to be built on site with others, Correct. that, uh, that it, might be, it might be that we ought to look at uh, lowering the time statutorily by law, changing the policy so it would be shorter. Uh, has anything been talked about uh, in that regard at the NEI? Right. So time to market is one of the most important issues with any electricity source. Utility companies have, most of them, have state-imposed obligations to serve. They're granted a service territory, but in exchange for which, 
they must meet the electricity requirements within that service territory, obligation to serve. So they've got to forecast out what the demand is, and they have to build the generation necessary to meet that load demand. So when they're looking out to 2015, 2016, 2017, they do a forecast. They decide how much new electricity they have to generate, and then they try to figure out how to meet that generation. And if you're looking at a nuclear plant, you say, okay, I can submit an application to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They'll approve the, the license. Here's my construction schedule. I'm very certain of that. And you can say, okay, in 2016, I'm going to have this much power online from a nuclear plant. But if instead you look at the NRC and you say, I don't know, they could take 42 months, which is what they've said they've taken to review the license application, but they could strip out, it could slip out to 70 months or 90 months. All of you are just saying, well, that nuclear plant, I, I might like to build it. it. I might even think it's going to be the cheapest source of electricity. But if it's not going to be online in 2016 or 2017, I can't meet my state statutorily imposed obligation to provide electricity. I'm not going to build it. I'm going to go build a gas plant instead. And so what you have to recognize is that the, as much as we've talked about CO2 and meeting global requirements, utility companies in the U.S. are running businesses that have to meet their, their customers' no, no, but requirements that's not, in certain years. That's no. not my point. My point is, it, is, is, is it, does it seem like that we, it is taking too long and that we could, uh, we could by, by statute law, say it's going to take less time in, in that upfront before you start construction? Currently, it seems to it me takes. you could. Currently, it takes the NRC 42 months to review the license application. Yeah. It takes us 40 months to build the plant. What, what, why does it take all that time for them? Cannot that be looked at to see if they could do it in less time? Without a doubt, particularly when we talk about building the next plant. So we've built a Westinghouse AP1000. We're going to build another Westinghouse right. AP1000 next to it. It should not take 42 months. I think it should take 24 months. And even then, when I look at 24 months, I have a hard time understanding why it takes 24 months to consider an application for an identical reactor right next door to an existing reactor. If we are ever going to scale up on the levels necessary to meet our energy requirements in the U.S., we will have to significantly shorten the licensing time frame. I don't think Kenwell can this doesn't have anything to do with, uh, necessarily have anything to do with uh, the technicalities that we are speaking of here. But when the first new application was filed at this go-around, the company asked if I would go to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission outside, not inside, just outside, and, and deliver with them the license, the application, the whole package. And I said, of course. We went and uh, they had me deliver a box uh, this big. And that was the license application, that was the application. Uh, they said that before all the new technology, the license would come up here in three pickup, three to five pickup trucks. That's what the paraphernalia would be. Now, I tell you that only because there's that much change in uh, the technology is brought to, to the license, what it looks like and what you give the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So it seems to me, somehow or another, part of this problem is the modernization of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's approach to passing judgment on the safety of the plant. And there's a lot of lot more known today than, than there was when we built the last one before Three Mile Island. And I think until we get that out there, we're suffering. These people listening to this today, they're going to say, obviously, nuclear power is never going to make anything. It takes too long for everything. Something else is going to happen. That's just the way I look at it. And I hope we can begin to develop something in that area. I'm not there anymore, but I'm willing to join in some groups that will work on it. Thank you, Alec. I want to uh, thank Alex Flint for what I thought was a wonderful presentation. And uh, it's, it's always fun to sit around and be around people that uh, can step back and look at the whole forest and, uh, and not just the trees. I, I would, I have already given him his sacred bottle of New Mexico water and although it's probably bottled in California or someplace. And he also will receive one of these tiles, but I could not take that away from Helen. She wouldn't give it back to me so to present to him, but it will come in the, in the mail also, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you very much, Peyton, and thank you.
Thank you, Ellen and Alex. I thought that was a great uh, afternoon. I, I learned a lot of things, but one of the things that struck me that I did not know is that the life cycle cost of nuclear energy is, is smaller than, or less than other sources. I found that to be rather surprising. And I found that the, the urbanization of the world going forward, this is probably the only alternative that exists if you're going to worry about CO2. So we've learned a couple of things, or at least I've learned a couple of things that are very important. But I want to tell you a couple of other things. One is, it, as they say in the South, that come up a big cloud outside, uh, which means it may rain. And there are going to be some covered vans for those of you who need transportation. And it's in the southeast corner down here of, of the Corbett Center. So uh, you just go downstairs and go out the southeast corner. And if you don't know which is the southeast corner because you've turned around a little bit, Surely somebody down there, one of our bright students will know Southeast, I'm sure. Uh, the, the next thing I would remind you is there's a, there's a reception at 6 o'clock this evening here. The reception will be out here, beer, wine, some snacks, in anticipation of our evening event with Secretary Napolitano. And so that's going to be another wonderful session that we'll have, with Secretary Napolitano being a New Mexican at one time, but has one of the really tough and challenging jobs in our, our government. There's one thing I'd like for you to ask, ask you to do for me. I made a terrible mistake this morning when I rose early to come and prepare for this conference. I forgot uh, today is my wife's birthday. And my, would you, this is my wife, Kathy, here. Would you please stand? <laughs> and I think, I think to end the session, would you all join me in singing happy birthday to Kathy, and I'll probably be off the hook after that. Would you please join me? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kathy. Happy birthday to you. <coughs> we'll see you at 6 o'clock. The preceding was a production of New Mexico State University. The views and opinions in this program are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the NMSU Board of Regents.